climate in Earth's past. So if I can ah, start to click slides. So what I want to start with uh, is to go over what we know about kind of natural variations in Earth's climate. And so what I've got showing here is kind of three different images of a top-down view of the planet. And so the one in the middle here is probably what you're most familiar with. This is what the planet has looked like. Um, again, looking down from the Northern Hemisphere since about 1850. You see Greenland here in the middle. Um, you know, this is the climate that, that we're used to and that our grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents were used to. Um, but you go not that long ago, about 25,000 years ago, and the Northern Hemisphere looked very different. So that's this image here to the left or I've essentially got a very large ice sheet. This is called the Laurentide ice sheet that sat over most of, much of North America, right? Um, in New Jersey, we're familiar, the ice sheet almost came down to where we are now, um, covered most of, of New England and large swaths of, uh, well, essentially all of Canada, but the earth was a very different place. And, and we know that from a variety of different observations. Um, but one of the most important things is that in addition to being a lot colder, um, and as a result, there being these large ice sheets sucking up a lot of, of the ocean water and lowering um, uh, sea level across the globe, is that the amount of carbon dioxide or the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere were much lower. And so this is one of these things where, you know, we're interested in this because understanding the past and understanding what, what caused the climate to be very different 20,000 years ago gives us some idea about how it is changing in the present and how, again, it might change in the future. As an example of this, you know, we're all kind of uh, popularly familiar with the idea of, of probably global warming and climate change. But for those of us like me who look at Earth's past, you know, we kind of look at the future as, as in the lens of through analogs of, of Earth's past behavior. And so what I've got here to the right is another top down photo of the Earth, but this is the Earth um, for what we think it looks like about 3 million years ago. And here you can see Greenland, which today has, is covered entirely by ice being essentially, you know, as its namesake, being mostly green at this point. So we think that Greenland did not have any ice sheets about 3 million years ago, that the earth in general was much warmer, maybe about two degrees C on average. And that's a number that is thrown around a lot today is kind of what the amount of warming that the earth might be looking for or looking like in the next 50 to 100 years. At this time, sea level was substantially higher. You know, there are some large uncertainties on this, but something on the order of 20 meters, which would be 60 feet. So much, much higher sea level at this time. Um, and critically, something that, that we'll kind of get to is what we're trying to answer as scientists. We don't have a very good idea of what the amount of greenhouse gases, things like carbon dioxide were in the atmosphere. And so the overarching kind of motivation with the science that we're doing in looking at ice cores in Antarctica is to really try to get at understanding what was the composition of the atmosphere. How do we understand um, uh, that in the context of what uh, climate was like three million years ago? And what can that tell us about um, how it might be over the next, again, 50 to 100 years? So to just take a little step back, and I promise I'll be brief in this sort of introduction, is that the notion of why Earth's climate has changed in the past, you know, dates back you know, a couple of hundred years. And, and the start of this, Hap, uh, happened around the 20th century uh, by this guy named Milankovic, who was really the first to um, propose that the long-term variations in Earth's climate, so why we were in an ice age 20,000 years ago, but we're not in an ice age today, had to do with largely with how Earth uh, orbited around the sun. And there were three aspects of Earth's orbit around the sun that he was interested in. One here, the eccentricity in, in the middle, here, the obliquity or the tilt. This is how much the Earth's axis is tilted uh, relative to the horizontal plane. And then the precession. And this is a more complicated one to understand, but the easiest way to think about it is how the top of a, uh, the, the axis of a top kind of processes around as it's spinning. The bottom line is that these three aspects of Earth's orbit, Milankovic hypothesized were the dominant reasons that Earth went into and out of ice ages. And this for a long time was a um, uh, leading hypothesis for what kind of caused Earth's climate to vary in the past. A very substantial contribution to this came along, you know, by somebody in the 20th century, uh, Sir Nicholas Shackleton out of the University of Cambridge, who was essentially the first one to go and demonstrate that by measuring the chemical composition of small marine fossils that live in the ocean and essentially die and sink to the bottom of the ocean, and then we collect them in cores and measure them, allow us to reconstruct kind of what broadly speaking, the climate over the Earth 
was like over the last three million years. And so this is a plot, a kind of famous plot of his I've got showing here on the right, going from the present day back to about three million years. And the key takeaway is that each of these wiggles that they are showing here are kind of ice ages that the earth has gone into and out of. And so in the very first picture, I showed you the modern climate. This was the one here in the middle at point two. And I showed you their last major ice age. That's the bottom here of this first wiggle right here. And you can see that these wiggles go up and down and up and down with some regularity and they get smaller. And on average, the earth kind of gets a bit warmer, right? It trends up towards these pink colors, which in this diagram uh, indicate warm temperatures on the earth versus cold. And so this is kind of the, the, the large scale image of kind of what natural variations in Earth's climate have on, gone under the last three million years. And this is again the point three that I, that I pointed to here where Greenland was entirely melted. And so what we wanna again understand is what were causing these variations? Why has the climate varied in such a fashion? And what role did things like atmospheric greenhouse gases versus orbital variations have to play? Now, um, the reason we think of greenhouse gases as, as having a very important role in this story kind of stems from this picture here, which is, for those of you who haven't seen this, this is uh, Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, um, where, you know, kind of the, the, one of the climaxes of the movie is when he gets on this little people mover and shows you how high the red curve goes, right? And the red curve here is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the blue curve here is a temperature, is a record of uh, the temperature in Antarctica essentially showing us some of the same information that we were looking at on the last slide in terms of the earth going into and out of these big ice ages. And so again, if I were to show the last ice age here is this blue, this, this uh, low point here in either CO2 or temperature. And then this is the pre-industrial world in terms of temperature and in terms of CO2. And so Al Gore was showing quite dramatically how humans were perturbing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to levels that at the time we hadn't seen. This, this plot goes back, I believe, 800,000 years, but the Earth hadn't seen in at least 800,000 years, right? And so this was one of the main lines of evidence that scientists have used to say the temperature of the Earth and the amount of greenhouse gas, gases in the atmosphere, they go together, right? And when greenhouse gases are high, are high the Earth is warm. And so this is, turns out to be an important line of evidence for you know, why we should do things like mitigate the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now. So this is all fine and good, right? Those wiggles that, that I showed with um, in the previous slide from Al Gore showed a very compelling story of how the ice ages are linked to the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this is just another diagram that's showing the same thing. Each of these ups and downs is a change in carbon dioxide, and these are linked to an ice age cycle that we see in the top figure. And we've seen a couple of slides go. The problem that we have is that the record that we have in ice cores only goes back 800,000 years. But as I've shown, this record above goes back much, much further, right? This allows us to peer much deeper into Earth's history and look at different um, times when Earth's climate was different. And in particular, as I said, this interval back here was generally warmer, right? And we would like to know, we would desperately like to know, was it generally warmer because there was more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or for some other reason, right? And so there is a, a kind of a, a strong scientific curiosity in knowing what does atmospheric carbon dioxide do the further you go back in time. And the difficulty with this is that ice cores are essentially the, <clears throat> the best archive for preserving um, atmospheric, records of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And, the reason for this is the very simple fact that ice cores trap small bits of air in them. And so um, uh, are as close of a direct archive of essentially bits of ancient air as you can get, right? They're almost as good as having a time machine to go back in time and sample the air um, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of years ago. So just to give you guys an idea of what is an ice core, what am I talking about when I talk about ice cores? This is a diagram here showing you essentially how an ice core forms. So what you start at is you start with something hopefully we're all familiar with, which is, except not right now in the middle of summer, um, which is snow at the surface, right? So in some places at the poles, it snows and that's all it does, right? It never melts, so the snow just snows and snows and snows. And as it accumulates kind of year over year, that snow compacts. So one year snow snowed on top of another year snow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This snow will essentially pack up and end up um, uh, uh, 
compacting and pressurizing the snow that's at the bottom. And this process, which is called densification or fernification, involves kind of the transformation of the, the, what you are familiar with as the kind of beautiful snowflakes into kind of granular rough snow that you know, some of you skiers or other people would be familiar with after kind of freeze thaw or other cycles, right? In, in the poles, as in the, on the, in the, in the, where these ice sheets form, this process of kind of snow compacting goes on for hundreds of meters, right? So this is hundreds of feet thick until there's essentially so much snow overlying it that the underlying snow is compacted into ice. And the little spaces that exist between the snow grains that hold little bits of trapped air actually get closed off and become these little bubbles, right? So these are bubbles of what is, um, <coughs> bubbles of ancient air that are, are trapped and sealed in the ice as it's buried. Now there's a detail here about how the air is slightly younger than the ice in which it traps. That's because the ice, the air can still communicate through these pores while it's being buried. But that's a detail that we scientists worry about, but for the purposes of this, um, it's not that relevant. So what does it look like? This is kind of a blow up image of what an ice core actually looks like. And fortunately, you know, the discussion, you don't have to, to, to imagine very hard that these are little bubbles of ancient air that are trapped inside this ice. And so when we take this into the lab uh, and analyze it, we are doing nothing more complicated than figuring out an intelligent way to extract the air from these bubbles uh, and introduce it into our uh, mass spectrometers and other chemical analyzers. So how are ice cores done? Um, typically, and why is kind of what we're doing a little bit unique? And typically, um, ice cores are, are, have been drilled in Antarctica since the 19, well, 50s and 60s, um, but most uh, vigorously kind of since the 1980s. And the approach that people have gone is to kind of look for the simplest ice cores to, cores to drill. And here they look at essentially domes, so the top of these big ice sheets. And the reason for that is that if you pick the top of a dome, like this point here, and just drill straight down, you get a very simple kind of layering where as you go down, the ice gets older and it does so in a very kind of systematic and orderly way. And so you can generate a beautiful, what are called time series. So we can have every depth essentially point translates into a different age and we can create a long kind of record of what uh, climate has done continuously over that period. And that's the records that we have seen that were shown in Inconvenient Truth. Those all come from these deep vertical ice cores. So the, for many reasons, most of which have to do with financing and the fact that, that it is expensive to go a deep, drill in deep ice core and you actually don't know how old the ice is at the bottom until you've already drilled it. Um, many countries uh, have moved away from, from kind of coring these continuous deep cores. They still happen for a variety of projects, but for those of us who are essentially interested in getting as old ice as possible, we've had to look for other ways of doing it. Um, so I'd say it's deep drilling for lazy ice core scientists because in this case, we're gonna let the ice sheet kind of do the work for us and bring some of the old ice towards uh, closer to the surface where we can access it by kind of easier um, uh, drill rigs and drilling means. And so on the left here, I've got the diagram of the traditional drill core. On the right here, I've got an image of what we're relying on, which is essentially glacial flow into a, an underground or a sub, uh, uh, subglacial mountain range causing the ice to be deflected up and essentially bringing some of this very old ice that would normally be at depth up towards the surface, right? And this happens in what are called blue ice areas. And they're blue because this deep glacial ice gets brought to the surface is blue. And, <clears throat> and when you look at it, it's a big, nice blue sheet. <clears throat> exactly like this. This is actually just an image of the Allen Hills blue ice area. This is all this exposed ice sheet here in the middle. This is an image, a map down here in the bottom left showing you where we are in Antarctica. And here I've now included this little diagram just to again, refresh you what the heck we're doing there and why we're drilling ice here, right? It's because we're letting the ice sheet do the work, bring the old ice to the surface, and then we're gonna run around here and drill ice cores and, um, and date them and, and analyze them for a variety of, of climate properties. So I'm almost done here. I wanted to cover one more topic, um, which hopefully I can get through, which will have some uh, scientific interest, which is how we actually date these ice cores, right? So what I've shown you is we've gone to Antarctica, we've decided we're going to drill ice cores in these 
uh, interesting places where old ice may be pushed towards the surface. Um, but that itself comes with a whole variety of complications because the ice is no longer kind of a well-ordered book, right? It's kind of like somebody have, has taken out all the pages and torn them up and cast them asunder. And so we have to kind of put these back together. And the chief way to do that is to figure out how old the ice is that we are actually looking at. And the way that we do that is by measuring an aspect of the air that is trapped in that ice. And in particular, we are looking at the, um, a gas called argon, which is a noble gas um, that exists uh, in air in about 1%. But what's really cool about argon is that all of the argon just about in the atmosphere today was not there four and a half billion years ago when the earth was um, brand new. It has been produced from the decay of potassium in rocks. And so what I've got up here is a very simple decay equation where you could just think of potassium, a certain isotope of potassium, in this case, potassium 40, decays to argon 40, um, which is a gas. This has happened over geologic time. What happens on the left, we've got early on in earth history. On the right, we've got today, right? So much bigger argon 40s because once the argon is emitted to the atmosphere, because it's a noble gas, it kind of has nothing to do, nowhere to go. So it just accumulates. And so much of it accumulates, in fact, that when you look up what is the chemical composition of air, about 1% or just about the third most important constituent of air is this argon that is produced from the decay of potassium. And so what we are essentially doing is measuring how much less argon is in the air of these old ice cores because today is about is the most argon that there will ever be and if we go in the past there should be less argon in the ice. What that looks like in terms of measurements, this is a plot of time, so 800,000 years ago. These are ice cores where we know the age independently. And this is a measure of how much argon. So today we have something like this. And as we go back in time, the amount of argon isotope, uh, argon 40 in this case, goes down. Right. So this is just telling you that we are dating these ice cores by measuring how much, ar how much less argon they have in them compared to the modern atmosphere. And to me, this is a very cool way of dating ice. So what did we find? What's kind of the take home message for, for you guys? The, the take home message for the science is that we found really old ice, right? So this is a zoom in of two cores we drilled at this area, both of them about 150 to 200 meters deep. And I'll zoom in on the bottom 10 or 15 meters of these core here in the right. Age is on the X axis and depth is on the Y axis. And without, you know, paying too much attention to uh, the signal that we see, you can see there's a lot of samples of ice that are substantially older than 1 million years, right? And so this limit or this, this oldest previous ice that Al Gore had shown of 800,000 years is somewhere over here. And we're now recovering ice that extends much older than that. And so this is exciting because it now allows us the opportunity to go and reconstruct a number of aspects of you know, greenhouse gases and other things about Earth's climate system back in this period of Earth's history, which we, prior to this, had no records of what uh, the atmosphere looked like and what um, greenhouse gases were. So um, that's essentially the end of, of the science overview that I've got for you guys. I've known that I went at least a couple minutes over, but we've had some papers published on this. If people are interested in the scientific papers, I'm happy to turn those over. Um, Happy to also talk about all the exciting science we can generate from these, um, but I wanted to get to my little contribution for science communication, which you know I can't even take credit for because I didn't take the video. Um, but this is probably the thing that will be seen. You know, my indelible mark on humanity will probably be a viral video that I put on Twitter um, about what a, a sound an ice core makes when you drop it back down the hole that you just drilled it from. And so I'm going to end um, by just showing this video which has, as of late, is something like 3.7 million views on Twitter um, and uh, is pretty cool, I have to say. So I'll end with that and, and then turn it over to the artists. Awesome, thank you, John. Um, I, there are two questions, and maybe as we're turning things over to Todd, um, you might be able to really quickly answer these. Um, so Katrina asked if there are other independent methods of dating the ice. 
Um, and I think Laura has a related question, which is what happens if at some point there's warming and so you lose layers and you have perhaps an unconformity there. Um, does that affect the amount of argon that you have in the ice where you're sampling? These are great questions. And um, the answer to the first one is that dating ice this old is, is there aren't many methods. And so this argon method that we're talking about has large uncertainties and is less than ideal for that. But, um, but the bottom line is there are not many methods to date the age of ice. Um, it is an extremely tricky thing to do. And so that's in fact what our lab has kind of been pushing and working at is figuring out ways to do that. Um, and find independent ways to try to date this. Uh, the answer to the second question is, is undoubtedly if there were any melting in this core that could, could create all sorts of problems with the analyses that we end up doing. Um, we feel pretty confident that, um, you know, one of the advantages of drilling again in these sort of very shallow areas is that they tend to be really cold and really cold all the way to the bed of the glacier or the ice sheet in this case, because it's really thin. It's really only 100 or 200 meters thick. And so the, the annual average temperature somewhere there is like minus 30. And so at least today, it's never gotten close to freezing. Can we guarantee that in the past? At some point, no, but I think we feel pretty confident that at least you know, for the, the duration of time where we have that record that it's probably been um, very cold not to have an issue with any melting. Excellent. Well, let's turn things over to Todd. All right, and Todd, you are also muted. There we go. How is that? Much better? Perfect. All right. Okay, before I get going, um, get my timer here going, just wanted to take a moment to thank you, uh, Catherine and Sammy and Jason um, and the Council for Science and Technology for putting this on. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to pick up uh, right where John visually or left off on Twitter. This is the Allen Hills Blue Ice area that John was working in. Um, so my name is Todd Anderson and I'm an artist and I went to Antarctica with Ian, who you're going to hear next, and he's an artist too. And we went there as uh, part of the National Science Foundation's Antarctic um, Artists and Writers Program. Um, our work uh, kind of centers on uh, the global climate, climate crisis. We've been working together now for about 10 years. So we're in a lot of ways, we're not just artists, but we're science communicators. Um, by way of introducing my work and by extension Ian's, I wanted to share the work of another artist by the name of Alfredo Jar. Now I'm not gonna read subsequent slides, but I do, I am gonna read this one because I think this quote by Jar might get to the kind of heart of maybe what we're, we're trying to do with this workshop. Um, culture is a prison and we intellectuals have to get out of that prison. Enough of me speaking to you and you speaking to me, me applauding you and you applauding me. Let's get out. Let's reach a larger audience. For both Ian and I, Jar's work has kind of been instructive over the years um, because his work was really fundamentally about uh, outreach. Let's see if I can, here we go. So I'm gonna share just a couple works by Alfredo Jar on just one of his projects and then transition to um, my work with uh, Ian. What I like about Jar's work is he works off a basic principle as an artist and it's, it's called the KISS principle. You might've heard of it, K-I-S-S. -S. It's keep it simple, silly. And so what Jar will do is when he settles on an issue that he wants to talk about as an artist, 
is he tries to simplify it and he tries to break it down into small bits or pieces. And so I'm just going to show three artworks that kind of embody these three different parts or this kind of approach in this case for him talking about the genocide in Rwanda. Um, so we'll first look at an artwork that kind of embodies this idea of just trying to announce or tell people that there is in fact a genocide going on in Rwanda. So Jar started this project in August of 1994, which was the same month that um, hostilities ceased in Rwanda. And I regret that I don't have a slide of this particular art piece at night, because at night what happens is you see this glowing sign that just says Rwanda over and over again, kind of in the darkness. And it really nicely embodies that metaphor of a light in the darkness. But what's informative about this kind of first piece to the series is that he's not trying to do a lot of things. He's just trying to bring up the topic, bring up the issue at hand uh, with his audience. So from that piece, he went on to try, create some artworks that could somehow share news about the genocide itself, a way of testifying or bearing witness. And so when he went to Rwanda, um, you know, he describes the experience as kind of just being horrific, you know, like maybe the most horrible thing that he's ever experienced in his life, a million people dead. And this work in particular, I find really, um, quite nice because if you read the back of these postcards, you'll just see a single person's name, like in the top left, it says Jerome, followed by this simple phrase is still alive. And I think this is an informative thing that sometimes as artists um, or just as people, right, we confront like these really heavy issues and really sad things and to somehow celebrate something without denying like the heaviness of the issue at hand is, can be sometimes you know, therapeutic and a healthy thing to do with your audience. And so he just wanted to send these postcards to say, this person's still alive and, and what a miracle that is. So if we were to see this larger project of jars in a museum, we might start in a room that's darkened and has that light box. And as we move out of that room, we'd be moved into another room that might show artworks like this that serve as kind of testimony to things that he experienced and saw while, um, you know, working or, or let's say visiting um, Rwanda. And then you would be escorted or not really escorted, but you would move through that space into another or a third room and that it might be totally dark and you'd encounter a piece like this, which is a very large light table. And it's filled in this case with a million slides. And as you got closer to the light table and said, well, what are these pictures of? You would see that it was one single picture. In this case, it was just a close-up of the eyes of a 12-year-old boy by the name of Ndu Waezu. And this little boy he met in a refugee camp. And the boy had witnessed his, both of his parents hacked to death uh, by machetes during the genocide. And this boy's only response was to not speak for about four weeks. And so what Jar is trying to do here is create a memorial, right? Something that can speak to this larger thing that happened, but yet situated very precisely, in this case, in just the eyes of one single person. And what he's doing to us as viewers, or really attempting, is to make us connect quite, you know, viscerally with another human. And when art works, and it doesn't always work, it can work really well in creating those kind of empathetic ties 
um, with another person. I like this quote by Jar because it also kind of talks about how difficult um, it is to be an artist sometimes and that it really is impossible for artists like Ian and I to really truly represent the reality as we see it. And so all artwork and I, certainly mine is just a, an attempt at trying to create artwork that might tap in or connect with um, the way you see the world and maybe alter, you know, slightly change the way in which you see the world too. Um, so I'm going to pivot to uh, Ian uh, and I's work, mainly, I suppose, um, our artists' uh, collective work. So Ian and I have been working for about 10 years together, and we're part of an artist collective called The Last Glacier. Um, Ian and I would be remiss if we didn't mention Bruce. He's a really important part of our art practices um, because we've been working together for so long. Um, Ian and I were um, went to Antarctica uh, through the NSF and are working with John now on this project. Bruce isn't working with us on this particular project, but um, you're going to see some examples of Bruce's work. So I want you to, wanted to put a face with that work of his. Um, so this is uh, essentially kind of what we do um, as uh, artists, what we end up doing. This is a large scale artist book. Sorry about the moray pattern you're seeing. As soon as the pages start, it's the book cloth that's making that weird pattern there. Um, I'm gonna pause it here. This might be the most important page of all of our books. This is, we make a number of these different artist books on differing, um, for differing projects. This is a science uh, essay by Nancy Mahoney, and it's an essay about glacial retreat in Glacier National Park. And in some ways it kind of sets up what you're gonna see in the rest of the book, which is artworks by um, Ian and Bruce and myself. So as you turn the page, you'll see a photograph by Ian a woodcut print of Salamander Glacier in Glacier National Park by myself, and then a woodcut by Bruce. Another photograph by Ian. Uh, Grinnell Glacier uh, by myself. Ian's rendition of Grinnell Glacier as a photograph. Uh, Swift Current Glacier by Bruce, and onward. What we're trying to do with these books, there's a few things. Um, one, we're kind of borrowing um, strategies from people like Alfredo Jarre, which was they're trying to take this really large issue of uh, global heating and trying to distill or focus that down into one kind of specific topic, in this case, Glacier Retreat and Glacier National Park. So when Glacier National Park was founded in 1910, there were about 120 glaciers. Um, at the end of this decade, all the glaciers will have ceased to exist because of uh, climate change. So we started this project uh, back in 2010 when there were still 25 glaciers. And uh, our goal was to go to Glacier National Park, create artwork about these glaciers, um, work with a scientist who can help us understand what it is we're looking at, and then try and combine all of our kind of unique vi divisions, the, the scientists and the artists into one kind of larger uh, book project that kind of tells this story. We'll look at one more artist's book here in a second, and I'll talk a little bit about, our, about artist books in a second. Um, I'll mention that being an artist is a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a lot of work, but for that work uh, project in Glacier National Park, um, Ian and I spent uh, with Bruce about five years working on it. Uh, we spent four summers hiking in Glacier National Park. And so one of the kind of neat rewards sometimes uh, for my work is getting to go to some pretty uh, neat places. Uh, nothing really tops um, Allen Hills. This is Allen Hills flying in. There's a little shadow of an airplane you might be able to see there on the ground. That little speck sort of dead center is John and his team's ice coring tent 
Um, just out of view are um, those tents I showed you in the beginning, those yellow tents, the base camp. John's base camp was about a, a kilometer, I think, um, away from his ice coring site, or at least this particular ice coring site. He was coring at multiple sites. But yeah, it's a real privilege as an artist to sometimes be able to do these types of things, to uh, fly into Antarctica, meet a, a great science team, and uh, learn about uh, the past. My specific artwork is uh, woodcuts. And I do a uh, type of woodcuts that are called reductive jigsaw woodcuts. And so on the press bed, kind of on the left, is the wood block that I used um, for the, one of my prints. It's called a jigsaw print because I cut up my wood blocks into pieces like a jigsaw puzzle. And then what I can do as an artist is I can ink up the different pieces in different colors, reassemble the wood block, and then put a piece of paper on top of it and print it at this multiple colors at the same time. It's called reductive woodcut because I just use one single piece of wood to create all the different colors and layers that you see in the final print in the top right. So it's an old kind of 15th century process. So I'm kind of not far back as the last ice age that John was talking about, but sometimes I feel like that's where I live uh, in the past. But it's an old uh, fashion process. Uh, usually these prints take me about a month or so to make. Um, as a printmaker and just like a photographer like Ian, we can work in multiples. So for any given image, like that print of Salamander Glacier on top of the pile, I'll make usually about 25 of these prints. And they're all considered original works of art, just like a painting. Um, I'll take that pile and I'll take maybe 15 of those prints and then put them into the books themselves. So the artist books are basically collated original works of art. So they're either photographic prints that are original, that are Ian's, or they're woodcut prints um, that are original. My leftover prints, um, I can then frame individually and then you know, exhibit these in museums or galleries or um, sell them to different collections or collectors as well. So it helps as an artist for my uh, practice to be sustainable. And Ian does kind of works the same way. Uh, one last book I'll show you that just came out. It's called Romo. Romo is the uh, government's abbreviation for Rocky Mountain National Park. This was a project uh, I think we spent about three years on documenting the last seven glaciers of Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, Jeff Renicky, who is a writer, a longtime writer for Outside Magazine as well as National Geographic, uh, contributed an essay. There's a print of mine on the left, a print of Bruce's on the right the print of Bruce's there on the right, and then a large photograph of Ian's. So the artist books themselves, as I was mentioning earlier, are considered works of art in and of themselves. And so we target these books um, to different museums. So like uh, the Met or the Getty, those types of places. And then sometimes personal collectors as well. Um, but the idea is that we really want these in public uh, spaces. So we also, uh, seek out special collections of different libraries so students can go and look at these books. Um, but uh, so if you went to the U.S. Library of Congress, you can see these types of things of ours. And that's really our goal is to try and um, bring our art uh, to another audience. And by working with the scientists, it's the same ideas. We're, we're trying to give people like John kind of a, something different, a different platform for him to reach a different audience. Um, artwork also is, you know, a multi-generational conversation. So these works are meant to outlive ourselves. And so I think personally, that's, I think, kind of one of the neat things for the scientists is that they can write kind of knowing that, you know, somebody 50 years from now might be reading this, um, which isn't always the case with like science publications necessarily. Um, so, um, Let's see if I can move on. So just real quick summation, um, thinking about like how do we communicate ideas as artists and, and as communicators, you know, we can think of Jar that keep it simple, silly, um, you know, kiss principle. For Ian and I and Bruce, and then now John who's helping is, we work on a principle of just a let our teammates do what they do best. So I think it'd be really entertaining, but we're not gonna ask John to do any woodcuts. Um, 
And we're also just trying to be really specific. And so instead of like trying to make an art piece about the global climate crisis, like we're just gonna focus on the Allen Hills and these beautiful ice cores that John and his team are like pulling out of the ground. Um, Ian and I are really purposeful in terms of trying to combine like the emotive aspects of art with kind of like the analytical power of science. And those are just strategies for reaching a larger audience. Um, my only last thing I just wanted to kind of throw in before I hand it over to Ian is that, you know, collaboration itself is so wonderful and I can't recommend it enough. And the important thing I've learned um, from working with like Ian and people like John is that how important it is to embrace unique conceptions of the world around us and that sometimes they compete, but by giving everybody kind of an equal voice, um, it's really wonderful to see kind of what comes out of this type of work and these types of collaborations. So with that, um, Ian also asked that, uh, to let you all know that you can contact us anytime uh, between now and Thursday and then anytime after. So this slideshow will be available on Google Drive for you so you can get the uh, address uh, there so you don't have to write right now. So. Um, while, while we're switching over to Ian, um, there is a question, Todd, about what you do in the field, um, given that you work on woodcuts. Um, presumably you're not doing the woodcuts in the field. So are you taking photographs? Are you doing drawings? It's evolved over the years. At first I started with trying to do watercolors and drawing, but then I started working with Ian and this, you know, photographer, he wants to get up at dawn. He wants to like get at the first light and we're always on the move. And then the environment's harsh. And so I started just trans, you know, myself starting to work from photographs as well, just because Ian's on the move, we're after light. And that's kind of what I've, I'm starting to learn to see the world that way. And then I'll bring my photographs back and mainly work off of photographs um, from there. So, yeah. Excellent. Um, before I turn it over to Ian, um, I know that it is um, 5.50 local time on the East Coast. Um, so translate that to where whatever time zone you're in. Um, so I, I anticipate we're going to go over a few minutes and I hope people can hang on. Um, if you can't, no worries. Um, I will be sending out an email um, later tonight with instructions for Thursday. So I hope that you are able to come back on Thursday and um, stretch some of your artistic muscles um, in, in the workshop on Thursday. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ian. Hi, my timer. Um, hey, everyone. Um, I'm Ian. And uh, I, I just was looking out my window and I wish I could uh, show you what I was looking at. But I'm, I'm in Montana right now. I teach at Montana State University, um, just at the edge of the Rocky Mountains. Um, and yeah, um, you might have gathered from Todd's presentation that this process of making a collaborative artwork is a long process, um, three to five years. And so, you know, we were in the Allen Hills in November and we're just starting to think about what that might look like, um, what that project will become. And what I wanted to talk about today is specifically collaborating directly with scientists on artworks. So I wanted to show you this. This is my, my favorite image to show. Um, this is uh, Chimborazo. Some of you might know the Chimborazo is a tall mountain in Ecuador. It's actually the tallest mountain on earth because the earth is an ellipse and it's the furthest point from the center of the earth. Um, and uh, in 1807, oh sorry, with 1805, I think, sorry, 1802, um, Alexander von Humboldt and Aimé Bonpland um, climbed to 5,875 meters on this mountain. And this is a basically a, an interpretation, a map of Humboldt's um, scientific findings on the mountain. So you'll see on the left and the right hand side, these very kind of um, carefully delineated columns where he is setting out um, 
precipitation, humidity, and other um, sort of scientific measurements that he took on the ascent up the mountain. And then on the engraving of the actual mountain itself, you'll see other texts and basically there are different species of plants. Um, and so as you go up in elevation, the plant species distribution changes. So why I love this image so much um, is because it brings art and science together. Um, I think for, for many scientists, um, I'm not a scientist, I'm an, I'm an artist, but for me, I guess, looking from the outside, it seems like that science has become very, very narrow and very difficult from someone outside of that expertise to interpret. And so how do you bring what you're finding as a scientist to a larger audience in a way that's understandable? And I think that art is that perfect mechanism to be able to do that. And so, you know, working with Todd on these books and um, since about 2015, um, I've been making direct collaborations with scientists in the hope that we can do that. And I think this will be the ultimate intent of the book that we make about the Allen Hills is that it will really blend, meld together um, the art and the science. This is just a, a detailed view of the, uh, of the map. Um, oops, sorry, wrong way. So in, um, so in 2015, I met this guy um, and he's a, um, a geologist, but also he studies glaciers um, in Peru and in Tanzania. And I emailed him and I said, hey, I'm really interested in glaciers and ice and what they tell us about Earth's history. Can I come along with you on a trip? Um, I didn't really know any scientists. Um, and I thought, there's no way this guy's going to let me come along. And turns out he did his graduate work at Montana State University. And uh, he emailed me right back and he said, I'm going to Peru in uh, two months. Do you want to come along? And I said, yep, I would love to go. So um, the first collaboration I did with was with um, Doug Hardy. And this is him on top of uh, Kilimanjaro uh, in 2016. This was his 19th time climbing the mountain. Um, if any of you know anything about Kilimanjaro, it's just shy of 20,000 feet. Um, it's just a hike, but it is a really hard hike. <laughs> Um, so this guy, I mean, ice scientists are the toughest people I've ever met in my life. They're kind of crazy. Um, and I like to tag along as long as I can. So this is also on Kilimanjaro. Um, Doug has these different automated weather stations um, on top of the different ice fields. This ice field in particular is the northern ice fields. It's the the thickest piece of ice still remaining on top of Kilimanjaro. Um, I think it's about 50 meters thick and it's at its thickest point, but it's melting really fast. So these are various um, weather stations that have been erected by Doug and um, some Norwegians and some Germans. They all kind of look after the weather stations together and every year Doug climbs Kilimanjaro to download the high definition data um, off the weather stations. Some of it he can do remotely via satellite, but apparently um, not all of it can be done that way. So in 2015, this was a year before I went to Kilimanjaro with Doug, um, we went to Peru and his other research sites um, is on Calcaya Glacier, which is um, a large ice cap uh, in Peru. It goes to about uh, 18,300 feet, if I remember correctly. And this is a, again, another automated weather station that Doug has constructed over many years. So he works with a machinist at the University of Massachusetts and each year he will bring a new um, element to the weather station. He'll add it on 
and it, it grows in size every year, although he, he says now that he's done with this thing. So when I went, um, and this is at the summit, it's really high up, um, not much oxygen, and these guys are digging um, snow pits, um, they're coring ice cores, um, and they're working at this elevation 14, 15 hours a day. Um, really, really hard work. Um, and um, John will tell you all about that in Antarctica as well. Um, but I was struck by this weather station. For me, it was just this uh, really amazing modernist type of sculpture that, was the, that is this scientific instrument. So I made this very straightforward, simple photograph of it. And when I got back, I made a large print. This print is 30 by 40 inches. And I sent about six or seven of these prints to Doug and I said, you know, can, you, can you write on the print and let's see what happens. And this is the result. So you can see um, in the snow on the sides, um, his very careful annotations that labels every element of the weather station and explains um, what the purpose of that is. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, I love the precision of it because it, it, for me, it mimics the precision of the weather station itself. Um, and it perfectly sort of blends this, um, this modernist sculpture with science. So when I got this back, I was just like completely stoked and like, this is amazing. And so since then I've been trying to figure out how can I go with scientists everywhere they go to do their awesome research. Um, this is a, a detail of that. One of the, um, the labeling of the different elements and what's the purpose of each one is. Another scientist on that expedition is Karsten Brown. Um, he teaches at Westfield University, also in Massachusetts. And um, I've been now on two trips with him. We went to um, Uganda with Todd um, last year. Um, and you can see, so this is also Kalkaya Glacier, a very a different kind of photograph and also a very different kind of annotation. And so one of the questions I get, you know, when I talk about this work is, well, you know, what direction do you give to the scientists in terms of what you want them to do? And I really only talk about the idea behind the project, which is climate change and deep time. I really don't want to direct them too much because I want their own artist to come out. Um, and that's what I hope you guys will think about over the, you know, tomorrow um, and Thursday is, you know, how can I bring my artist out? Um, so the, the way he annotates, you know, it's, it's kind of at an angle, there's some drawings, an arrow here actually sort of shows the flow of the glacier direction. Um, it's kind of all over the place. And so I think it really expresses in a, a really interesting way um, the different character or idiosyncrasies of, of us as humans. Um, so just to step back slightly, my intent with this project is, it, it's rather grand, <laughs> um, you know, obviously it's not really attainable, but um, I, it's inspired by the idea of the clock of the long now, and this is a clock that's being built inside a mountain in Texas that's gonna run for 10,000 years without much intervention by humans. Uh, it's uh, being built by the Long Now Foundation. And the intent is really to get humans to think about the deep past and the deep future, rather than just the immediacy of living day to day, so that we can be stewards to the planet and think about ways that we can um, preserve the earth in a way that there is a future for humanity. Uh, so I, I just, I love that idea. And um, I specifically then search out scientists who are paleoclimatologists, right? Who are looking at 
bodies or things in the earth that re record earth's history. And so ice is then really that, that perfect metaphor for that because it traps that air and we can look back at time. It's this perfect archive of Earth's history. So um, I work a lot with um, graduate students at the university where I teach. So this is um, Pamela Santi Banez uh, Avila. She's um, since um, got her PhD, she's now a doctor. Um, but she was working on ice cores from Antarctica. So um, what, what John talked about, and this is from the Waste Divide, West Antarctic ice sheets. And this particular ice core is in a, um, I think John can correct me, a level one clean room, I think. Um, so a lot of preparation goes into uh, working with this ice core, very precious. It's been transported all the way back from Antarctica. Um, it's unwrapped inside this very clean environment. Um, all the surfaces are wiped down. Um, Pamela is in this, you know, Tyvek suit. Everything is, she, you know, absolutely clean before she starts working with the ice. I was not allowed in the room. I'm photographing her through a window. Um, and she then cuts the ice with a bandsaw. And this particular core is 10,000, um, 10,833 years before present. And so Dr. Um, Avila's research is on pollen and bacteria, um, organic life that's blown from Africa and from South America onto uh, Antarctica, and then becomes trapped in the ice. So she melts the ice and she extracts the DNA from these various organisms. Um, again, locally, uh, uh, graduate student in geology at Montana State University. So this is a, a lake that um, is just about a 40 minute drive from my house um, called Fairy Lakes, really pretty. Um, and James Bennis is the um, geologist's name. And he rows out onto the lake and he drills mud cores and extracts these mud cores from the lake. And so in this piece, I was interested in trying to bring the laboratory into um, the landscape. And so I photographed the, the mud core in the laboratory um, and then in Photoshop superimposed it on top of a landscape that I made um, of the lake itself. So I'm just gonna check my time. Oh wow, I'm at time already. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to wing through a couple of things here. I'm going to go over a couple of minutes. Um, I think it's important not to, as Todd said, get stuck into this sort of very narrow view of the world. Um, we can sometimes put these blinders on. And I think our job as artists is to try and help people see bigger pictures. And I, I'm very interested in our work, working with scientists who are interested in oral histories as well. And so um, this is a collaboration I did with, uh, again, um, a um, professor at Montana State University and her research is on Bighorn Medicine Wheel, which is uh, in the Bighorn Mountains in um, Wyoming. And so this is a, a, um, a wheel that has been around for 10,000 plus years constructed by native peoples to track movements and uh, important events um, of celestial bodies that line up with um, important um, dates in their calendars. So um, she really blends together these oral histories of native peoples along with her scientific research of um, these alignments of celestial bodies. I'm gonna skip through these um, and get to so this is the first collaboration um, from the Allen Hills. Um, this is Antarctica and the dark stripe through the middle of the blue ice is called the Tefra layer. And um, it's basically uh, vol volcanic dust. And 
if you can imagine back to John's description of the way the ice becomes vertical, this layer of volcanic dust or tephra is being pushed up vertically, so it becomes this line through the ice. So I asked John to describe for me um, what I was seeing in this photograph, and usually I don't annotate them myself, um, but I, I had a sort of specific vision for this piece because of the lines in the ice that I wanted to follow with the annotations. And um, so this is the kind of thing that I'm hoping that um, Todd and I will do with the other scientists and with John for the book and the various art pieces that we will make about um, Antarctica and the Allen Hills. And probably, you know, three years from now, that'll come to fruition, hopefully. And that's what I got. All right, excellent. Um, well, we are um, over time here, so I think we um, just wanted to finish up with a prompt for what Thursday will bring. Um, and uh, so, so before we do that, I just want to thank our three speakers again, because um, this was really fantastic um, and I appreciate it. And thank you to almost everyone who's been able to stick around. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen because I do have the um, prompt for Thursday. Um, and so Thursday, um, you know, we, we wanted to today give you um, background on their work, but Thursday we're gonna turn things over to you guys. Um, and so the prompt for Thursday is for you guys to um, either use one of the images that we've provided on the Google Drive, and I've put the link to the Google Drive um, folder on the, um, uh, into the chat. Um, so there, there are a couple images there that Ian has provided, or you can use one of your own. Um, and to manipulate it in some way, um, either with software, Photoshop, Painter, Illustrator, or um, to print it out and manipulate it in a more analog form by drawing on it, by cutting it and reassembling it, um, writing a personal reflection. I am particularly excited if someone actually does an interpretive dance because all I can think back to is um, my time in Alaska skiing around on Bench Glacier and um, not very gracefully and so I'm imagining, we imagined at the time that the grizzly bears must have thought that we were the clumsiest moose in the world with our ski poles and <laughs> skis. Um, so maybe I'll do an interpretive dance based on being a clumsy moose. Um, that will be this level of dancing I can do. Um, and so what we will do on Thursday is have a little bit more um, interactivity with Todd and Ian and John around their work, um, but to let you guys talk about sort of how you took their ideas and interpreted them yourself. Um, one of the things I love about what all of you talked about was sort of trying to see a landscape in a different way. Um, and that is all of our challenges for Thursday. Okay, so um, I've provided the link. I will provide the link to the um, Google Drive folder in email. Um, later today, but what you'll see are um, a couple of different folders within Antarctica materials. Um, so there is the prompt for Thursday, which is in this Google slide here, and a short article that John has provided um, non-technical about some of his research. Um, some photos that Ian has provided that if you would like to use that as a basis for your work, um, you are welcome to. And upload your work here, which is where you should drop any files, um, whether it's a video or um, if you want to take a, um, just a camera shot of your work that you've annotated, um, scan it, whatever, whatever works for you, um, you can upload it there. And we'll break into small groups on Thursday and have you just talk about what that experience was like for you. Do not feel like you need to be expert. Um, final thing here are the presentations from today. So um, if you're interested in those files, they are here for you to download. Okay, with that, um, did I miss anything?
Todd, John, Ian. No, happy to answer any questions if anyone has anything pressing. Okay, we'll, Same, we'll hang I for um, a few minutes if anyone has questions, um, but I will echo what um, my colleague Daniel has written in the chat, which is thank you so much for sharing all of your work and we look forward to more discussion on Thursday, same time, same Zoom link, um, and we hope everyone comes back for that.